Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be here today and uh, uh, see very different aspects of, uh, of uh, privacy. So in my talk, I will rather focus on uh, visual data and privacy issues related to that. And uh, so I will give some examples of different techniques which can be applied in order to, to hide some private information in uh, visual data, so images or video. And then I will uh, address another topic, which is how to uh, verify that actually the info information you wanted to conceal has effectively been uh, hidden uh, by the, the techniques described previously. Uh, then I will also discuss briefly about some uh, new technologies which are underway in uh, uh, image acquisition or video acquisition and how they can also impact privacy issues. And, and then I will uh, wrap up. So a little bit of uh, context first. So when we say privacy on video, people first uh, think about uh, vid uh, video surveillance. And uh, this implies very different applications from the different sector to the transportation uh, system, uh, buildings, commercial buildings, and, and so on. So I've searched on the internet uh, for uh, some numbers. I think there is a a uh, fairly large num uncertainty on, on those values, but I, I found that the estimate for the number of cameras, video surveillance cameras in the UK is four to six millions, which is uh, quite high, and apparently UK is doing very well in this respect. Uh, <laughs> and in, uh, in London, or the greater London, there are an estimate of 500,000 cameras. And uh, from a long time ago, so maybe it has changed, but there were estimates that uh, someone in London is uh, film about 300 times a day by, by uh, uh, video surveillance. And uh, of course, related to that, there is also uh, a well-documented history of abuse, uh, ranging from very different things, like just simply having footage released publicly on the internet, to having some uh, law uh, enforcement officers blackmailing people using video surveillance system, and so on. In uh, combination with uh, this very high number of uh, video surveillance systems, uh, there is also uh, very uh, much advanced video analysis tools which are uh, becoming available uh, to do things like uh, object detection and tracking, uh, even being able to track an object across different cameras, different viewpoints, uh, things like face detection and recognition, which is becoming rather robust or things like uh, recognizing automatically license plates, which is used in uh, many systems in different cities to control access to some parking or even to, to some uh, city center. And currently, there is uh, a lot of activities. One is on deep learning. If you are doing uh, engineering stuff, you probably it's also impacting your field. It's uh, about everywhere. And it has high promises to further improve those different techniques. And also some uh, data mining techniques, which allow to handle a very large amount of data. So those tools are becoming very, very powerful. And in combination with this very high number of cameras available, uh, this can be a, a source of uh, privacy issue. Uh, a few other numbers, which are uh, kind of interesting, uh, on social media. Uh, so on Facebook, and I searched for that uh, a while ago, so it has probably increased by now, but there's an estimate of two to three terabytes of pictures uploaded every day. And on YouTube, 300 hours of video uploaded every minute. Those numbers are huge, and on social networks, sites like Facebook, and I'm a user, so I'm also guilty, uh, people are giving a lot of uh, private information where uh, we can then be exploited, and also it allows to link different sources, like from a video surveillance system, you could link to some uh, uh, content which is on social media, publicly available, and, and make connections between those different sources of information. But privacy is not only about video surveillance, so here I'm comparing some uh, estimates on the market size. So for video surveillance, it's estimated that 150 million cameras per year 
mobile phones, and I'm sure everybody in this room has a mobile phone, and your mobile phone has at least one camera, sometimes uh, even two. So the number of cameras on, in the mobile phone market is estimated to be one billion per year. And uh, there are also some other uh, applications where they don't come to mind at first, but for instance, the automotive industry, uh, it's estimated that by 2020, so that's almost uh, tomorrow, there will be 100 million cameras sold per year, where most cars will have several cameras looking in the back, in the front, and so on. And again, a huge amount of data which is uh, acquired by those systems. <coughs> so this call for the need of uh, privacy protection tools, uh, and if you are here today, you are probably convinced that this is something uh, important. Um, I won't try to define privacy. I mean, that's a complex uh, uh, notion, but for me, as a working definition, I will simply say that it's personal information which can allow to identify a person. And this notion of identifying someone is also rather complex because, of course, by the face you can recognize someone, but even uh, hiding the face, uh, if you have information about the gender or the race or the color of clothing of someone, even if the face is hidden, you can still know who this person is. So. Ideally, those privacy protection tools should handle also those different uh, uh, aspects. <coughs> so many of the privacy protection tools uh, are trying to, on one hand, identify the regions in the image or the video which are containing private information. Um, depending on the settings or the application, those could be some predefined zone if you know that your camera is looking that way and the camera is static and so on. You could say this part of the viewpoint I will uh, consider as private information because that's where people will be visible. Ideally, you rather would like to have something which is uh, automatic and in that case you could define dy dynamically the region which is containing private information using video analysis tools, for instance, face detection, uh, people detection, and so on. And uh, those tools are becoming rather robust and reliable. Or uh, in some other settings, like in, a, in, a, uh, in an office, you could use uh, RFID tags to, uh, to know what the different persons are, and therefore use this information to hide them from the, from the video surveillance system. And then once you have identified this, uh, those regions containing private information, you could try to limit the access to those information, uh, either by hiding them or by uh, controlling the access to them. <coughs> but as I said, this notion of uh, privacy, it's uh, very context dependent. It may depend on some uh, extra knowledge that you have uh, besides what's from the, coming from the camera and some, from some other source of information which could give you hints about, uh, about the scene. So privacy protection uh, techniques can be broadly classified into three areas. The first one, which is uh, the main one, uh, and I will speak a little bit more about that one uh, later on, is uh, developing what is called privacy filters. So once you have identified the regions in the scene which are containing private information, you could uh, distort those regions or hide the information in those regions in order to, to prevent access to this uh, private information. So those are really working at the, the pixel level. It's really image processing tools which are, which are applied uh, in order to hide information. The second class, which I will call smart cameras, could be uh, <coughs> another form of camera which is uh, outputting uh, a descriptor or metadata as output rather than an image composed of pixels. And for some application domains where you want some simple decisions or simple monitoring, uh, this could be efficient. Like if you want to, to check in a, in a tunnel or on a road if some cars are stopped uh, on the side of the road, you may not need a complete video sequence, but just need some descriptors which can then identify or trigger an alert if, if there is an event happening. So I will also discuss a bit about that one. And uh, the third category is to consider uh, security at the system level and to limit the access uh, to, uh, 
to different videos or different parts of the videos, uh, really from a, an access management uh, perspective, and, uh, and then controlling who has the right to access those uh, different uh, objects or, or videos. So I won't speak much uh, later on about the third one because uh, this is more a system aspect and it's not really related to the fact that it's a video. It can be any objects where you want to, to uh, limit access to, to them. So I will, I will speak now a little bit more about uh, privacy filters. So I'm sure you have uh, 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 already seen uh, some of them. Like one of very simple one is to, to sim simply pixelization. So that's a very naive approach where uh, you take a block of pixel from your image and you simply replace it by the average of this block. And this gives you something like that. Uh, so it's uh, extremely simple to, to implement. Uh, you can integrate it in different systems. That's quite easy. Uh, it has two uh, drawbacks. The first one is it's uh, irreversible. So if you want to do video surveillance, uh, even if you want to protect the privacy of the, the persons who are filmed by the cameras, you would like at some point when an event happens that you can still recover the information. And of course, if you do something which is irreversible, then you, you lose the benefit of uh, video surveillance. And the second one, which can be a little bit uh, counterintuitive, but I will, I will discuss it later on. Uh, actually, this method, although it seems that you cannot recognize this person here, actually, I will show that uh, it's not efficient at uh, hiding uh, identity. Another method, which in principle is very similar, is simply to blur some regions of the, of the image. So uh, for this, you just apply a, a low-pass filter either on the whole image or simply on the, the regions of, uh, of uh, interest. Uh, again, very easy to, to implement. Again, it seems that it's uh, efficient at hiding uh, the identity of uh, the persons. Uh, I will show again that it's not the case. Uh, and, uh, and obviously, if you just do a low-pass filter, this is, again, uh, irreversible. And in some cases, that's not uh, uh, suitable. Another approach, which is also very simple, is to, to replace the region of interest by, uh, by a mask. So we, we have a simple example where we have found two persons in the scene, and we simply replace them by a, a silhouette of a uniform color. Uh, again, very easy to implement. Uh, but if you just apply it in that way, then it's again irreversible. So for such schemes, you could possibly transmit in a different channel, which is secured the information that you have hidden, like the, the pixels corresponding to the person. But then uh, this is, uh, uh, again, uh, meaning that you, you're actually transmitting this information. So, so those methods are not really uh, suitable. And uh, um, <clears throat> probably a, a more uh, uh, appealing uh, uh, approach in order to hide information is to apply some really cryptographic tools, so do things like uh, scrambling or selective encryption, where once you have identified regions of interest, you could uh, uh, hide information from those respective regions by uh, distorting uh, the information. I will discuss uh, more in details different ways to, to do that. And this process can be made in a reversible way with some secret encryption key. And then this uh, secret key could be kept by some trusted third party. And such a scheme can be made secure in a cryptographic sense. So you have some confidence in about the security of your system. Now, if we apply this to, to video content, we have to pay attention to a few things. The first one is uh, a video is always compressed in uh, almost every system in the world, because otherwise it just just way too much information to, to transmit. So you have to consider the fact that you, your stream has been uh, compressed. Uh, and there are many standards to do that. Um, and you want this crumbling or this selective encryption to not to break the syntax of your code stream. Or in other words, when you send the protected stream to a normal decoder, uh, this decoder should not crash. It should still be able to decode something, even if some regions will be distorted. Uh, so in other words, the, the process should preserve the syntax of your stream. 
or at least it should be standard compliant. <coughs> the second important aspect is uh, the bandwidth is uh, really a critical aspect in most applications. Therefore, you want this uh, scrambling or encryption not to uh, affect too much the compression efficiency of your system. You don't want to double your bandwidth or, or something like that. And finally, also, the, the complexity is an issue, especially video data. That's a very high throughput. And uh, also, many applications like video surveillance, the, uh, it's very cost sensitive to, to the, the processing taking place in the, in the camera. Uh, therefore, the, the overhead in terms of complexity that you want to add should be reasonable. So now th there are different ways to, to embed those different things in a, in a video. Um, one way is to apply it on the, on the code stream after compression. So I will not discuss video compression too much in detail. Some people in the room may be familiar. but. Uh, very basically, when you compress a video sequence, you divide your image into small blocks. And then on those blocks, you apply a transform. So to be precise, it's a discrete cosine transform. And you can see it a little bit like a Fourier analysis. So it's analyzing the frequency content on your, your image. And the reason to do that is afterwards, the content is more suitable to be compressed. And another component is what is called entropy coding, uh, which is assigning to each of the symbol, in that case, transform coefficient that you produce. It's assigning a code word, so zeros and ones, in order to produce your compressed strings. And this entropy coding will take into account the fact that different symbols will have different probabilities, and therefore you can rep uh, represent your data with fewer bits. And uh, so, you can represent your compression scheme by those two blocks, the transform and the, and the entropy coding. And one way then to, to apply protection is to take these compressed streams and to apply the scrambling afterwards by flipping some of the bits in these code streams. Um, one of the advantages of that is you don't touch the encoder. So you have just your encoder. You can take whatever encoder uh, on the market, and you just add a, a post-processing afterwards in a different module to do this is complete. The difficulty is, is, on one hand, you need to pass the code stream. So you need to know what syntax elements you are dealing with. And uh, the, the most difficult part is, uh, as I said, you want to preserve the syntax of your stream. You want to, to remain compliant with the standard so that when you send it to a decoder, it doesn't crash. And if you start changing some bits here and there, that's kind of difficult to, to guarantee. So another way to do that is to do the scrambling in between the transform and the entropy coding. So we do this transform. We have transform coefficients. And then we will modify them in some way. And then uh, those modified coefficients will go to the entropy coding. And this will produce a code stream. So in that way, you are guaranteed that you, the, your, the syntax is uh, remaining standard compliant. So that's an advantage. And uh, <coughs> you should be uh, careful that the scrambling will not uh, affect too much the, the way that you can achieve compression. So the efficiency of the compression should, should not be uh, affected too much. So one disadvantage of this approach is that this scrambling needs to be inside the encoder. So you have to modify the encoder, and you can no longer use whatever encoder is on the shelf. So we have done some work where we embedded this type of technique in uh, different schemes. Here I will show an example with uh, issue 6 for ABC, which is one of the uh, state-of-the-art standard uh, video compression scheme. And uh, I won't explain too much how this uh, issue 6 for ABC is working. But basically, you recognize the T is my transform, and this CA VLC is my, uh, my entropy coding, so producing my, my compressed strings. And I will apply my scrambling. Uh, uh, just before this entropy coding. So I will modify some of those coefficients. And if I do it in the right way, I will hide information from the video. And uh, then my, my, uh, my uh, stream will still be standard compliant. And in the decoder, if it's an authorized user, he'll have 
a secret key available, you can do exactly the inverse. So you can recover strictly the same uh, video sequence. And if the, the decoder is not authorized, so it will not be able to do this, and it will just uh, decode some uh, scrambled data, but it will not crash. It will just display some things which are uh, noisy. So there are <coughs> very different ways to, to, to do uh, this uh, form of scrambling. Here we'll briefly discuss two schemes that we uh, evaluated in, uh, in the past. Uh, so, as I said, we divide the images into blocks, and in the case of H.264 AVC, uh, this is done with four by four blocks, or so rather small blocks, so we have 16 pixels only. And uh, the first way that we, uh, we proposed was to uh, uh, inverse, in a pseudo-random way, the sign of the coefficients. So my uh, DCT coefficients, uh, I have 16 of them. They will have a sign, and I can flip it in a pseudo-random way. And uh, this will introduce distortions uh, in my, my data, so the information will not be recovered exactly. On the other hand, because this sign is not very strongly correlated, it will not affect too much the compression performance. And uh, another way to do is to take those uh, 16 coefficients in that case and to reshuffle them. And uh, again, this will hide information and not affect too much uh, compression. So I will show a video of this example. So this is a scheme which is fully reversible if you have the secret key at the decoder. You can transmit the same uh, stream to all users. You could even imagine to have different keys for different objects in the scene. This would be uh, quite uh, easy to, to do. In terms of coding efficiency, uh, because the modification we make to, to the coefficient is not too important, uh, the coding efficiency is not affected too much. And in terms of computation, it's, uh, the, the increase is uh, quite reasonable. So I'll try to show video sequences. <coughs> so on the left, you have the sign inversion, and on the right, the, the permutation. And you see that you can recognize the, the scene, uh, but the two objects of interest, in that case, the two persons walking around, uh, have been uh, hidden by this uh, scrambling procedure. So this is one way to apply some uh, privacy filters really on the, on the, at the pixel level, or uh, in, case, in the coefficient levels, and to hide information. Another uh, aspect I, I want to briefly discuss, and yeah, in terms of time I'm still doing okay, is to have a, a camera uh, which is not outputting a video stream, but which is outputting some uh, metadata information about the scene or some descriptors about the scene. So the camera could embed a, a DSP and run some image analysis uh, tools like uh, segmentation or trend detection or tracking, things which are uh, fairly reliable. And then it can, it can output uh, a description. So uh, I won't go too much into the detail, but there are standards to do that. One of them is uh, MPEG-7, which is based on XML, so one way to structure this information. Uh, I won't go into too much detail, but for instance, the output of this camera could be a text like this, which is describing the scene. So saying uh, what are the objects in this scene, uh, what are the positions, the trajectory through time, the color of those objects, and so on. Uh, but it doesn't output pixels. And uh, therefore, you could use this to reconstruct a scene where you could have, uh, for instance, bonding boxes of the different objects. Uh, which have been uh, captured by the camera, but not an image by itself. And this can be useful uh, for some scenarios. For instance, there are many applications where you just want to control that nobody is entering a, a given space or that people are moving in one direction and not in the other one. For instance, in airports, you have cases like that. With descriptors like this, you can fulfill this task without having to, to deal with images and with the privacy issues with that. So the next point I want to uh, briefly discuss is then how to uh, verify uh, whether those techniques are actually efficient at uh, hiding private information. And this is a, a complex uh, problem. And uh, here I will show one framework where we consider two classical face recognition techniques. 
Uh, the first one is uh, PCA, Principal Component Analysis, also known as eigenfaces. And the second one is uh, linear discriminant analysis. Those are maybe not exactly state of the art, or at least not anymore, but those are basic face recognition techniques. And we made some tests using the Ferret uh, database, or the database of uh, faces, where we use some training procedures to, to actually compute the space where you will project the, the face. For example, in the case of eigen faces, you will compute those eigen faces from a, from a training set. And then during testing, you take a given face that you want to identify the, the, the person, and you will project it in this space and compute a distance matrix compared to the person's with the, a known identity in this database. So if we do this uh, with the techniques that I described previously, so pixelization, Gaussian blur, or uh, scrambling, and here uh, what I'm reporting is the recognition rate by looking at the rank. So uh, rank zero means the first uh, face which is given as output, or rank one means the second best, uh, rank two the third best, and so on, and whether recognition was successful or not. So the curve on the top is if we just use the database without doing any uh, uh, privacy protection, <laughs> and we see, for example, in rank zero, we have about 70, 75% recognition, and then when we go higher, we get to, to 90 or uh, close to, to 100%. With PCA, we see on the, on the left, actually pixelization and Gaussian blur applied on the, the images you want to recognize. Actually, the performance is almost the same as the original uh, faces. So clearly, those methods are not efficient at uh, hiding identity. In the case of the other face recognition, LDA, things are a bit better, but even pixelization is still not very, very efficient. On the other hand, the, the scrambling technique that I described, those are the, the curve on the bottom, and those are much more efficient at uh, hiding uh, identity. So here, in that case, I consider just a simple attack, but I can also consider an attack where the user either has access to the protected data or it can, by observing the data, I notify that I'm doing pixelization with some pixel size and block size and so on. I'm trying to reproduce uh, this, uh, this uh, process when doing the training. And then if I do that, it's even worse than before. Uh, and now uh, pixelization and Gaussian blur, in both cases, they, they are not really efficient at uh, uh, hiding information. Also, the, the scrambling is still uh, efficient. OK, I'm soon running out of time. But the next thing I want to briefly uh, address is new technologies which are currently on the way for, for imaging. Um, there are different things happening. So the first one, which is simple, is uh, higher resolution. Uh, if you thinking, you are thinking about buying a, a TV nowadays, it's uh, called a 4K TV because the resolution is 4,000 pixels, more or less. Um, there are prototypes now for 8K systems. Uh, so at least in the entertainment uh, domain, those, those are realities, and then they can be used in uh, other application domains. There is a trend for higher frame rate, but probably for privacy issues, it's not as important. Another one which is uh, quite uh, uh, important is a high dynamic range, so capturing a higher dynamic of the, of the content, and I will briefly discuss more a bit on, on that. And some other uh, trends in also to, to try to improve the 3D immersive aspect of the video. Uh, nowadays, there are things like uh, free viewpoint uh, systems or light field representation, which allow to change the viewpoint of the user compared to a given scene. So obviously, if you go to higher resolution, like 4K or 8K, you have more details in your image, and you have more chance to be able to identify someone. And also, some of the tools that I described previously, we try to locally smooth the details. If you apply them on a very, very high resolution image, they may no longer be uh, as effective. High dynamic range, that's also something which is uh, widely used in some application domains, like entertainment, to produce uh, nicer looking images. And um, I, want, uh, I don't have time to explain in details how to do a high dynamic range, but 
the basic idea is you want to capture uh, details both in the dark and the bright areas of your scene. If a classical system, if you have like someone which is uh, uh, in front of a very bright areas, uh, either you have the details in the background, but the person appear totally black, or you could have the details on the person, but then everything else would be completely burned out. With high dynamic range, you can capture really the whole spectrum from the very dark to the very bright areas. So you have an image with a much higher contrast. And in that case, uh, on the same scene, you have the details both on the person and on the background on the whole scene. So obviously, for, for uh, uh, privacy, this is a threat because you have uh, much more information to deal with. In particular, there are many footage of video surveillance which are uh, impossible to use later on because the camera in such a way that there is a light coming near the camera and the, the, all the pixels are overexposed and there is not much to be exploited from, from that. With HDR, you have the possibility to really capture, uh, even in, with some very complex scenes, uh, a lot of details. And we have done some work to show that this is actually improving quite a bit uh, computer vision uh, algorithms. So uh, one difficult case in computer vision when you want to match different images is uh, the case where the, the two images have very different uh, uh, illumination conditions. So here on the top, for instance, we are on the left and the right, we have two images, one taking during the day and the one taking during, during the night. And in that case, uh, normal computer vision uh, techniques, and in that case, we use uh, uh, a descriptor uh, named surf, which is taking local information and trying to match them in order to identify whether those two images are from the same scene or not. And if we uh, apply them straightforward uh, by uh, using some, some way to process this high dynamic range data, uh, the performance is not very good. So here we have the, um, the green lines, uh, the yellow line and the red line represent correct and incorrect matches. And then there's a green line which show matches which are not correct due to the repetitive structure of the, of the scene. So we see that in those two cases, actually, most of the, the matches are, are failing. And uh, the system cannot really identify that this is the same object. But if we process our HDR image in the right way to optimize the performance of this uh, uh, matching score afterwards, we can get very good matching, even when those three images are very different from a, a, a visual perspective. So high dynamic range has a high potential to improve a lot imaging systems in terms of capturing a lot of details in during the acquisition, and therefore also in terms of uh, privacy. And the last thing I, I will briefly mention, I'm running out of time, there are also some new devices, things like drones. Uh, there are big drones, which are so far mainly used for defense and security applications, but there are many uh, application domains in the for civilian use, which are also considering such drones. Uh, for instance, we, we are in a French project uh, where we try to uh, verify railway tracks using such a drone. And then there are mini drones that everybody can buy in uh, uh, the supermarket. And they have a camera, and you can uh, deploy them wherever you want. And this is mostly unregulated. And you can have a, a video footage from a from, uh, very different perspective. And, in a very uh, uh, uncontrolled way. So we have also to, to take into account those new type of device, which can embed some, some cameras as well. So to wrap up, um, well, protecting privacy in visual data, that's a, a difficult problem. Uh, also, there are many techniques which are existing. And I've, I've briefly discussed some of them. There are many different variants among the same ideas. Um, the problem is still, uh, is still challenging. And there are very different difficulties which have to be addressed in order to really solve it. One is the fact that uh, this is a problem which is much con context dependent. Uh, you can infer a lot of information from the context from your scene just by not the object in that scene. And this is very difficult to take into account. But so it's sometimes difficult to express very clearly what are the user and system requirements in terms of privacy. 
um, verifying the performance of a production tool is also quite challenging, in particular to, to measure objectively whether uh, like a, something like an object or a face has been effectively hidden or not. That's a, a difficult problem. Performing really thorough security analysis of some of those tools. Then, depending on the application, you have to integrate into large-scale systems, and this should be done also in a cost-effective way. And we have also to consider the fact that there are new technologies which are appearing, which are improving the quality of the video, and therefore can also present a threat in terms of privacy. And the last bullet is, for many of those application domains, uh, there's no really business incentives for the, the ones who own the system to implement those tools. Uh, unless they are forced to do it by law. And this is another issue which, is, uh, 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 which has to be overcome in, in some way. And uh, this will just be my last word for Dilbert, and, and this is it. And thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions. Thank you. Uh, any questions? I have a question about, um, you analyze the attack on your privacy mechanism, but uh, one uh, attack could also be um, just um, exhaustive search of the key. So the key, your key space is just 16 bits when you're just flipping the, no, the, the signs. The key is not 16 bits. There is a key which, I didn't give all the details, but uh, there is a pseudo-random number generator, which has a key, which is longer than 16 bits. And then, yes, on one given block, you have 16 pixels. But if on one frame of the image, you have many more pixels. So if, is it that every pixel is, uh, has 16 bits? Is it the idea? No. So every, so block, every, blo every, sign, every right? block of 4 by 4 pixels has 16 coefficients. Now, you have many blocks in one video frame. And many of those blocks, the one corresponding to the area you want to hide, will be scrambled. So in that case, uh, actually, I have a slide. Uh, it was hidden, but I can, I can go back to that. So, oh, sorry, don't see. So, if you suppose you have a, a very small frame, so SIF, that's uh, uh, rather small for video surveillance, we assume that the region of interest, the part you want to scramble, is 5% of the image, which is also quite small. This is corresponding to 316 blocks and 5,000 coefficients. And uh, therefore, if you just do the, the random sign, we have 2 to the power 253 uh, possibilities. So an exhaustive search is kind of difficult. And we, we have tried also some ways to, to apply like uh, error concealment in order to try to reconstruct the blocks uh, without being able to, to decode it completely. And at least we have not been able to, to break it. Now, I don't claim that it's uh, unbreakable, <laughs> uh, but, but the security is more than just uh, a key of 16. So the, the key length, so the key has to be transferred uh, securely? So the, uh, well, in, in our implementation, we use a public and private key system. So there is a private key which needs to be well, stored by someone if you want to reverse the process at some point. But the point. length of the private key has to be the, when it increases with the length of the key? Yeah. So uh, I'm not sure what we use, but probably something like 256. Or I'm not sure the, what we use. In the, but this is related to the pseudo-random number generator, which is used to flip the square fissions at random. Well, I guess my question is kind of related, but um, because I don't work on video coding, it's yeah. not clear to me how how unpredictable the sign or the permutation of these things are. So maybe you could say something 
hopefully for the general audience about uh, how general it is that we can just flip the sign on things and uh, it becomes obscured versus permute things and they become obscured. It seems to me the sign should be predictable, perhaps from some machine learning. And no, the, the sign is not really predictable. I mean, the the uh, the amplitude of the coefficients is correlated uh, because it's uh, I don't know your background, but uh, uh, so those coefficients are obtained using a DCT transform. So this is doing some kind of frequency analysis, and you have one coefficient which is the average of the block, and then you have coefficients corresponding to details in your block, like edges and things like this, and if they are repetitive structure. And, uh, and the sign itself uh, will not be highly correlated because it's uh, depending on whether you go up or down and things like this. And uh, I don't think you can really predict them in an easy way. Now, again, uh, and this is some point which is hard to, to prove. But, but we, we tried to use some simple error concealment methods, and we didn't succeed. And then likewise, with the, with the permutation, you can see you expect the energy to be in the lower coefficient. Yeah, but definitely the energy after the transform is concentrated in the lower coefficient. Uh, that's why you do the transform, actually. <laughs> uh, but this is not entirely true. I mean, you have significant coefficients which are also farther away. And those are the ones which are also containing more information, because they correspond to the high frequency and the details. Well, the lower coefficient correspond more or less to an average of the block. Uh, so by, by distorting some of those, even if they are seldom but high frequency coefficient, they will impact a lot. I should say also that the DC coefficient is also scrambled or permuted and so on. Uh, if you don't do that, if you keep the DC but just uh, modify the other coefficients, then the effect is much, uh, much weaker. So um, you mentioned that one other method is to do uh, this scrambling after the yeah. uh, encoding. So, yeah. um, uh, do you, so comparing to that, what, what's the disadvantage? What was the disadvantage of that? Because that at least gets rid of the correlations when you do the. Um, so, so doing the scrambling on the compressed stream, while in terms of coding efficiency, you have the same. <laughs> uh, so you don't change the size of the file. So that's very good. One of the difficulty is uh, if you have as a constraint that uh, a standard decoder should not crash when receiving the stream, so it should decode something which is uh, noisy. Uh, and this is a, a feature that you want in many applications. Then uh, if you just take your stream and start flipping bits, very quickly you will break a decoder. Uh, you will break your syntax. And, and it's But you yeah. de-scramble it before you? You discrumble for the ones who have the key. So for the one who has the key, that's fine. But someone who doesn't have the key, you still want to be able to decode the video. Even if it's not uh, past time and there have been some distortion, so you still want to decode. So you want to, to display the blurred image or something. 